Now, years of war and chaos in Syria has led to somewhat of an explosion of a parasitic disease known as Old World Cutaneous Leishmaniasis in the refugee population. To learn more about this situation, I am joined by Peter Hotez, MD, PhD. He's the founding dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine and professor of pediatrics and molecular virology and microbiology at the Baylor College of Medicine. In addition, Dr. Hotez is one of the co-authors of an editorial on this exact topic in the journal PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases. Dr. Hotez, welcome back to the program, sir. Uh, thanks for having me on. Oh, I'm delighted. I'm delighted. A very interesting paper. I think I've talked to you about leishmaniasis in the past several years ago. And... Um, but this, this paper really expands upon, this editorial expands upon the situation going on with these refugees. Now, the parasites in the genus Leishman, Leishmania, uh, they cover a wide variety of diseases caused by a variety of species. Um, so to start for my uh, radio audience, how does somebody contract Leishmaniasis? Well, thanks for the question. So Leishmaniasis is a parasitic infection caused by a single-cell parasite. Uh, in this case, most of the cases in Syria and Iraq are from a parasite known as Leishmania tropica, and they're transmitted by sandflies. So you, when you get bitten by sandflies, the sandfly inoculates the parasite. In fact, the salivary glands of the sandfly actually immunomodulate the host to make it easier for you to become infected with the parasite. It's an interesting uh, relationship that's evolved. The big issue is it's not just the problem in the refugees. It's the fact that we're seeing most of the cases in the conflict zones where ISIS is uh, occupied in Syria and Iraq. So what's happened is uh, with the uh, horrific uh, civil war that we've all been hearing about uh, in the news, there's been complete, complete collapse of the health system infrastructure. Garbage is piled up. The sandflies are proliferating. And this has created an explosive epidemic of cutaneous leishmaniasis in Syria and Iraq. Uh, now the refugees are, uh, people who are fleeing the conflict are infected. They're entering uh, new areas uh, in the refugee camps in Lebanon and Turkey. And, this, and the sandflies are there as well. So this is helping to establish new foci of infection. So what we're seeing is a result of the conflicts there, a uh, big massive outbreak of cutaneous leishmaniasis in the Middle East now extending into North Africa. Right. Now, um, for those that are listening who are not familiar with this parasite, can you discuss the different types of disease um, based on the different types of species and then put a lot of emphasis on old world cutaneous leishmaniasis, the uh, symptoms, please? Sure. So the, um, unfortunately, it's a fairly complex system. So there are at least 20 different leishmania parasites that cause human disease that produce a range of clinical symptoms uh, relate, ranging from uh, the cutaneous form that we're talking about today uh, that we're seeing in Syria and Iraq, but other forms of the disease can produce uh, organ involvement that involves the liver, the bone marrow, the spleen that causes leukemia-like syndrome, which is highly fatal and everything in between. So um, there are different species. We sometimes classify them as old world, what's in the Middle East and North Africa, Central Asia versus New World, what's in Latin America, and even extending up into Texas and Oklahoma, uh, in fact. So this is a wide-ranging parasite. About uh, 12 million people are infected worldwide, but right now we're seeing this uh, explosion of cases, as I mentioned, in, in the Middle East and North Africa. Okay. Now, you call it an explosion. Can you put the situation, you know, as far as an increase in numbers in perspective? Right. So that's the first question people ask me, exactly how many people are being infected. And the answer is we really don't know. We know something really bad is happening, but remember, it's impossible to do public health surveillance in war-torn areas right. in Syria and Iraq. You have NGOs, non-governmental organizations like the Doctors Without Borders, MSF, trying to do the best they can to provide medical care. Uh, that's been very challenging. You can imagine what it must be like to try to do public health surveillance there. So uh, we were taking our best estimate based of hundreds of thousands of cases based on what we're seeing among refugees fleeing the conflict, 
and making their way to safe havens in, in the uh, refugee camps or coming across uh, the Mediterranean. So there are guesstimates, but it looks like the numbers are quite high. Yeah, and with all the war and the chaos and the ISIS and all this destruction, uh, it's really done some damage to the infrastructure and the health care and so on. Well, this is actually uh, an interesting concept that uh, I'm not just starting to get my arms around, which is that we've seen this now as a recurring theme since the last half of the 20th century, now moving into the 21st century, where we're seeing cataclysmic conflicts, wars, in Africa, in Central Asia, in the Middle East, and elsewhere. And what then follows is a horrific outbreak of a neglected tropical disease. So we, this was noticed uh, in the uh, 80s uh, in the war uh, in Sudan when 100,000 people died from Kalazar, which is the visceralizing form of leishmaniasis that affects the liver, the spleen, the bone marrow. It then happened again during the 90s uh, with the uh, wars in Angola and Congo where hundreds of thousands of people perished from African sleeping sickness, human African trypanosomiasis. Then, uh, and then I'd like to say, well, Ebola in West Africa is on that same spectrum. So the reason why Ebola uh, arose out of Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone is not so much because it's tropical, but because of the terrible atrocities that collapsed the health system infrastructure. And then we saw 11,000 people perished from Ebola. So that was version 3.0, and now version 4.0 is what we're seeing with cutaneous leishmaniasis. Mm -hmm. Now, leishmaniasis is not something new to Syria. There is a history there. Yeah, I mean, even in good times, uh, the Syrian government uh, and the Iraqi government struggled with cutaneous leishmaniasis because it's so widespread and highly endemic. There, there were some inroads uh, prior to the prior to the war and uh, really taking off in 2011. But beginning in around 2010, 2011, the numbers just started to climb uh, exponentially. Yeah. Now, um, you also mentioned in, in the uh, paper, and you've glossed over it here, that uh, we're also seeing this in conflict zones in Libya and Yemen, and, and it's. It's for the same exact reason, because of the chaos and the war and the destruction of the infrastructure? In Yemen, we're seeing other things happening, as well as schistosomiasis. And by the way, even in Syria and Iraq, cutaneous leishmaniasis is not the only thing going on. We're seeing resurgence of polio, of measles. We're seeing, uh, uh, so we're losing ground on polio uh, and measles uh, because of inadequate vaccination rates. We're seeing resurgence of malaria and tuberculosis. And I think this is something that the world needs to really get uh, grapple with, which is the fact that when we see conflict, and when especially it's a no no holds barred conflict, like we're seeing in, like we saw in West Africa, like we're seeing in Syria and Iraq, we have to recognize that terrible neglected tropical disease epidemics will surely follow, and that neglected tropical diseases are as important a global health security issue as anything else that we could talk about. Now, I'd like to get your expert opinion and some clarity on the following question. Is there a concern with infected refugees of cutaneous leishmaniasis entering Europe or even here in the U.S.? Well, um, in terms of Europe, remember Europe has its own own version, southern Europe has its own version of uh, leishmaniasis. So leishmania and phantom has been around for a long time. It's been a very important opportunistic uh, infection of HIV AIDS patients. We've, not, we've noticed that a lot of interesting things are happening in Southern Europe over the last five years. We've seen the reemergence of malaria in Greece, chikungunya, West Nile virus in uh, Italy and Spain, dengue in Portugal, right. even schistosomiasis on the island of Corsica. Right. Which is something really surprising. So uh, what's happening in Southern Europe we don't really understand. Is it from human migrations coming from the conflict areas? But there's other things going on. There's been horrific poverty, economic downturns in Southern Europe. Uh, If you talk to the climate change people, uh, one of the interesting things that you learn is that next to the Arctic, Southern Europe is the next big shoe to fall in terms of climate change. So um, we're so one of the one of the I think for me this is an illustration that we need people trained to think in, in an interdisciplinary way who understand the environment, climate change, who understand. Uh, population movements who understand economics. 
um, the old way of thinking about infectious diseases is going to need to change. Yeah, I hope, I hope you're safe there. It sounds like uh, you got the whole police force out there. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm in uh, I'm in New York. I'm in Manhattan. So, oh, okay. Uh, there you go. <laughs> well, let, let me get some more clarity on though, because this is a I hate to say, it, but it's kind of a political issue. Is there a concern with Syrian refugees coming here and spreading cutaneous leishmaniasis? Well, the the sand flies are not widely prevalent. You know, right. you need to have the sand flies. They're right. not widely prevalent in the U.S. We do have some small foci in Texas and Oklahoma. Um, that would not be my overwhelming concern. I mean, um, I know this is a hot button issue, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, you know, in terms of the risk of and of you know, Leishmaniasis getting a foothold here, we have a health system infrastructure that makes that far less likely. Right. So, um, you know, I know there are a lot of people who want to find other reasons to block Syrian and Iraqi refugees because of of uh, security issues, but uh, I would not. I would not add leishmaniasis to that list. Very good. All right. And uh, my last question, the, the war and chaos is not going to end anytime soon in Syria. And uh, these uh, other areas and, re and the refugee crisis will continue. Uh, the ISIS is not going anywhere. At least I don't think so anytime soon. Now, given these dire situations, is there really anything that can be done to get this under control? Well, one of the things we're trying to do now in our laboratories in Houston is develop a leishmaniasis vaccine. Um, and we're we're getting some good success in the laboratory. Whether we're not we'll have the funds to take it to the clinic is, a, is another question. But um, I, I think that would be a go a long way if we could get vaccine out to people. But you know that's a big challenge. In but the I was going to say, how would you get the vaccine out there without risking your life? Yeah, we can't even get the vaccine for measles right. and polio. So uh, so this this is going to be a long ride. Um, yeah. and and there were just going to be no quick fixes here. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the uh, the editorial in uh, PLUS, um, Neglected Tropical Diseases. Dr. Peter Hotez, thank you, sir, for your time and expertise once again. Uh, thanks for having me on. You bet. Appreciate it. Okay.